And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Shiva Bandana from India. Give her a hand. There are two Europes. There's your Europe with whom I come to join with my heart, my love, my solidarity. There's the other Europe that colonized us 200 years ago and thinks they can colonize us again. And we are saying, no, we've learned our lessons. We know how to defend our freedoms. Our world is not for sale. Our earth is not for sale. Can you really patent a tree? Do we need to modify genes? To our amazement, we found that thousands of patents had been taken out on crops, seeds, and vegetables. Through gene modification, the biotechnology industry is in the process of developing new kinds of patented maize, rice, and wheat. Is the whole of creation for sale? Questions like these about life itself led us to the Indian nuclear physicist and environmentalist Vandana Shiva. A seed in the world of freedom grows on its own terms. There's no external computer that has to tell it, don't become an oak from a wheat seed the wheat seed becomes a wheat plant. It doesn't need external control. It's the ultimate expression of freedom. Barun Mitra is a neoliberal lobbyist with Delhi and London as his base. He's in close contact with the think tanks of Europe and the States and a firm opponent of Vandana Shiva. We gave the bullshit award for sustaining poverty to Vandana Shiva in Johannesburg last year because she has become the icon of the West, of the protest movements around the world who think liberalizing trade or globalizing, globalization is going to harm the poor. We think exactly the opposite. I think the poor have lost out precisely because they have no opportunity to trade. And the policies that Shiva and her kind are advocating are actually going to perpetuate the poverty going to keep poor people poor. We follow Vandana Shiva on a journey 
a voyage of discovery round the planet. Our first stop is at the farm at Dera Dun, at the foot of the Himalayas. Navdanya, the school of the nine seeds, started by Vandana 20 years ago. Today it has 20,000 members, farmers from all over India. Courses for all kinds of seekers of knowledge. Here even the buildings are environmental friendly. Every woman has her own design. Aha. Yeah, because I saw the way they tie it is so And every part of the country, it's different. Okay. okay. Depending on the rain, depending on the climate. Is it just dried or is it baked? I think no, 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 sun dried. It's just sun dried. It's straw and cow dung. Oh, bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do you think I sort of love that award? I never found it in inside. Because I think cow dung is the most beautiful material. Mm. Oh, these, all our walls are made of cow dung. Okay. <laughs> What is she really after, Vandana Shiva? Does she have the answers to our questions? We have a vision and we have a commitment. And our vision is life cannot be made subservient to money and capital. And people cannot be made subservient to power. That Navdanya is an alternative to the dominant structure, the structure of globalization, which for me started as the structure which was forcing countries to create ownership over life, it has become a structure that is addressing other aspects of globalization. It's addressing other property issues because Navdanya is about reclaiming biodiversity as common property, as the commons. It is about reclaiming knowledge as common property and not allowing that knowledge to be a monopoly. Hello? Hello? Vandashan and the right of ownership of life. A company at the hub of the debate is Monsanto in the United States. They more or less have a world monopoly on gene-modified organisms. We're surprised that they let us in and that they allow their directors to speak about gene modification and patents. So at this facility, we have uh, 122 growth chambers uh, that are on multiple floors. And these uh, growth chambers, we can duplicate the climate, temperature, humidity of any growing region anywhere in the world. We also have 75 research laboratories and over 475 uh, agricultural researchers working at this site in St. Louis. We have uh, 26 greenhouses, 13 on two levels. We have over two acres of greenhouse space. This is the, uh, the gene gun, or particle acceleration method for inserting genes into plants. This was developed in the, the mid-80s uh, as a way to insert genes into the grass crops, to the monocotyledons, which are like rice and corn and wheat. If we take uh, dust particles of gold or tungsten and we coat them with the DNA of the gene we want to insert. 22 caliber shell. It is a gun. <laughs> it is a gun. And it uses the gunpowder to blast that. And so it shoots those little, like a shotgun, it shoots those little pellets of dust and they go inside the cell. And so it all happens inside this plate. Here, you could either shoot the DNA in with a gene gun into tissue or you could uh, expose it to agrobacterium. And after a while, you begin to get growth. You begin to see a tiny little shoot. So these little plants start to set root. Now, once they get a good root ball like this, little, little, then they can just take it out and put it in a little pot of soil. It came from a single cell. The only DNA it knew was the, the, the 
plant it came from, except you added, like you said, a new gene. So it could be made resistant to an insect. variety has been marked, it'll be weighed, it'll be selected, then it'll be stored after drying and sorting out. All seeds that have disappeared, like this, is, uh, is linseed. And you can see how distinctive each variety is. Each variety is so different. And all of them have been grown here, I mean. This is all from our farm. And this is a very rare millet now. You hardly see it. It's called china. And it's also, it, it can grow with no water. If you have a total, it's a, it's a famine crop. If you have no water, no rain, this will still give you food. So because of climate change, we have a, a, a special commitment to reduce water use. And uh, in two months, in 60 days, it's ready. These are the most nutritious crops in the world, and they use the least amount of water, only 300 millimeters. So this is now my passion. The only way to feed the hungry is bring back these crops, because you need less water. The, that's where women's engineering really works. You need less water, and you produce more nutrition. create awareness and literacy about what are we being fed with. And it's the same as GMOs, you know. The fact that every genetically modified organism, no matter what it is, is bringing you a virus as a promoter, is bringing you antibiotic resistance markers, that no matter which GM food it is, just those two aspects of GM are dangerous to health. 90% people say we don't want GMOs. The region of Tuscany, its official policy is we will not accept GMOs. They will not grow in our area. In England and Wales, every year, every month, the, and I'm sure in Ireland too, every month the districts that are saying we'll be GM free are growing. So from the bottom people are saying, it's not your decision, we'll choose what we eat, you can't force feed us. But this freedom zones for food is one other very creative element to establish those farmer consumer links and reclaim the choice and freedom to eat the kind of food we want to eat. We visit the World Trade Organization meeting in Cancun in September 2003. 10,000 delegates from 145 countries are there. Environmentalists, lobbyists from all over the world. Can there be fair trade? What does globalization lead to? We are working towards an absolute food crisis. And the reason we are not noticing it is with WTO, all the governments are busy generating figures of trade. How much are they trading? Not figures of how much are they growing. So as less and less is produced and more and more is traded, there is an illusion of surplus but there is a reality of serious scarcity. And WTO actually has subsidies allowed for facilitating farmers' exit. When farmers are pushed out of agriculture or their incomes collapse, they don't go and buy cell phones. They drink the pesticide and annihilate themselves. That's what's happening in thousands in India. More than 20,000 farmers have committed suicide on our account. 